This is a fun movie. Nice, scary, fun movie. It's um, this one you think you've seen every found footage movie you've ever made. <laughs> this one comes along and adds a nice sort of wrinkle to the formula. I mean, I think the thing I liked about it the most is that the, the characters in it deal with real teenage problems, and that's something I don't think I've seen in a movie like this before. Was that your intention to... Oh, that's awesome. Thank you for saying that. I mean, yeah, it's true. Like, as much as we love Blair Witch Project and Paranormal Activity and, and all the other films in the kind of subgenre of, of found footage, they don't necessarily have characters who deal with issues. Mm -hmm. um, so, kind of the undercurrent of, of Nightlight is talking a little bit about teen suicide and, and fitting in and that kind of anxiety that you have when you're a kid and you not quite relating to the people around you. So that was that was definitely part of the challenge of the film. Yeah, and I think too, one of the inspirations for it as well is um, this real life forest in Japan called the Sea of Trees, which is this real life place where people go to commit suicide. And there's, you know, sometimes upwards of 100 people that do this. And so for us, like we wanted to bridge that into like the Americanized version and kind of tackle that subject that, that they're having over there. Yeah, that's fascinating, yeah. And I've heard a bit about that, and um, but I just again the real issues they deal with teen suicide fitting in fitting in is a huge thing in movies. You know, I mean, in, in teen life, I should yeah, say. Yeah, It was great to see you sort of work on that. And then, um, how do you two divide the uh, screenwriting and directorial uh, duties between you two? Um, Brian and I, we've known each other since we were 12 years old, 11 or 12, and, and so we've always kind of found this great working relationship where we're kind of hands-on on every single facet of, of directing um, side by side. Yeah, there's no real division of work. Um, filmmaking by its nature is, is a collaborative medium. Um, we're always calling on people, whether it's our cinematographer or our first AD or certainly our cast to kind of help us and, and our mantra is always best idea wins. So. Um, you know, there's not a whole lot of egos working with your best friend from, from middle school. Um, <laughs> and we start, you know, like we started with, with Star Wars action figures, so that's, that's where we started. It's come a long way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's either that or stuffed animals. <laughs> yeah. Stuffed animals, you know, yeah. We have those videos too. <laughs> yeah, I got those videos somewhere. <laughs> and um, when it came to casting the actors for this movie, what was most important to you, that they have some sort of improv experience or that, you know? Yeah, partly. I mean, I think also like some sort of realism because we purposely cast um, actors that not weren't necessarily like known commodities so that when audiences are watching it, they feel like everyday, you know, realistic teenagers. The other important thing that our cast had to have is they had to be able to perform for a seven to eight minute take that wasn't going to be edited together. I mean, some actors, um, you know, it's, it's kind of a well-known thing in the business that like some actors aren't necessarily as good as we all think they are because of editing and lighting and music, you know what I mean? The elements of, of cinema that we're all kind of familiar with, but our cast had to be able to perform for an eight minute take and it had to live in that performance and hold up under that kind of scrutiny essentially. So when we were casting, um, the auditions always ran really long because we had to see, you know, like did they have the chops for a long take. Nice. Nice. And um, why the title Nightlight? Was that in reference to like the night lights we have as kids or just a, a, the game? Yeah, it, it's, it's a part of the game. Like Brian and I, as kids, we used to play flashlight tag in the woods and kind of invented this game of Nightlight. And so I think like making the feature film was very much tapping into kind of that same notion when we were kids out in the middle of nowhere with just a flashlight. But it's also like we kind of like the idea that it feels like a rather innocent title, but at the same time, the film is very dark and menacing. Yeah, yeah. I was, darkness as a kid is always one of the most frightening things. Yeah. So it's right. nice to have some sort of light wherever you are, even if yeah. it, whether it's a forest or your own bedroom. And um, I always like watching this movie. All, I'm always reminded of how the spirits like to mess around with people and mm -hmm. just sort of play tricks on them all the time. And uh, and uh, with the spirit, he seems. That's he or she, I should say, seems to appear every once in a while. Was it your 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 intention to make the spirit like a supernatural being or? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly open to interpretation, but we wanted to, this feeling of claustrophobia and this feeling that there are things in this forest that are not safe and that are constantly encroaching on the characters. And I think that um, the hope is that if you watch the movie multiple times, you start to realize that those those branches. Um, in the background that look like faces might actually be faces 
um, we, we took very careful consideration to um, kind of continuously bringing in this evil force throughout the film in the background and, and playing with light. I mean, really, nightlight is, is what's scariest about the film is what you don't see. It's what's in the shadows and what's in the corners of the frame. Um, and we really, really tried to create a film where um, what you bring as an audience member with your own imagination, we feel like is far more terrifying than anything that we could show you as filmmakers. So we really wanted to kind of play on that kind of subconscious level. Nice. Yeah. No, that's definitely because what you don't see is always what you know messes with your head. I yeah. love that. Yeah. And um, I mean, there are some moments where I swore I saw someone like walking right behind a pair yeah. of trees. <laughs> you did. Was, like, that sure. really caught. <laughs> <laughs> And um, this movie doesn't have a, a film score. Did you ever intend it to have a film score? Or do you think it played better without? Yeah, we felt like because of kind of the constraints that we found ourselves in, like it's from the point of view of a flashlight, so you can't really motivate like an artificial score there. So what we had to do is uh, hire like some great sound designers that could kind of create this atmosphere in lieu of the score. Mm -hmm. So it was a really fun collaboration, and I think Brian and I as filmmakers, like sound has always been just as important, if not more, than the visuals to really create an atmosphere there so that was a big challenge of Nightlight to create that yeah I mean I, many of the greatest horror films of all time you could argue the score is what makes them terrifying I mean right. you think of Halloween you think of The Exorcist I mean even The Exorcist the score is only in that movie for like five minutes but it's True. so memorable and so eerie um, and so it was kind of a handicap in a way but our sound design, the sound design team like really I, I hope uh, I feel like for us found this kind of great tone and great feeling of the forest that um, works in spite of not having a score. Okay, great. Yeah, I mean, some movies work best with a score, some yeah. This one's good. And speaking of the sound design, it's, I mean, it's its always really creepy when you can hear voices in the background, but you can't <laughs> quite make out what they're saying. Right. And, um, can, can you fill us in on what they were saying, or do you want to just... <laughs> no, <make sense>? I <laughs> mean, yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit of a secret, but like what we love um, having in the woods is kind of this, this mythology that this is a place where many people have died, and so these spirits kind of linger there. And so what we wanted to make sure to do, uh, both, both artistically and also technically with kind of the 5.1 mix, is have these voices come from the sides or from behind, and you never know where they're coming next, much like the characters in, in the film. Yeah, no, that's great. It's always great when you have a 5.1 mix, because... Mm -hmm anything, you know, I mean, you can really mess with people's minds in the movie theater that way. Yeah. It gives more people reasons to see it in a movie yeah. theater, that's the other <laughs> yeah, that's especially horror that. movies. Yeah, yeah. Totally. And, um, yeah, certain scenes, I mean, uh, the one, one where the girl was talking about how she really wanted to be popular and fit in and had to break Ethan's heart, right, right. That's, that's, a, that's a moment I think a lot of people can relate to. Yeah. And uh, what went about writing that particular movie? Yeah, I mean, the, the character of Robin is a bit of an outsider, and I think that certainly Scott and I relate to that. Like, we were two, you know, film nerds <laughs> in middle school and high school. Like, we know what it means to not, like, quite, quite fit in and not... Um, and, and there was always that struggle, particularly in middle school, high school, where you're feeling like, oh, like, what group do I belong to? Like, I kind of want to belong to the cool kids, but they don't really accept me for who I am, and, and does that mean I does that mean I turn my back on my friends who actually do care about me? So that's certainly what we're exploring. Yeah, I think it certainly taps into kind of the feelings of rejection that you have in high school never fitting in 100%. So for us, like, that scene, um, in many ways, like, the movie kind of stops for a moment from, like, the scares and the suspense to really just have this honest character moment that we hope, you know, fans will, will appreciate in the films. Yeah. And, uh... You have a really good animal wrangler on this film. Right? <laughs> yeah. There are some certain yeah. scenes with animals I didn't see coming, and they, they really did their job, like the snake and, of course, the wolf. Right. right. Yeah, it was, it was wild because we're, we shot for, like, five weeks in the middle of nowhere in Utah, and so we are bringing in, like, these wild animals, and, and the wolves in particular were terrifying because as much as they can be trained, like, they're still wild creatures at heart. Our, our stunt guy, um, Don Shanks, on the film, he was a former bear wrestler, um, <laughs> oh, wow. and, which was a great asset. However, when the wolf showed up, he started to get a little timid and we're like, hey Don, like what's going on? He's like, 
those wolves will kill you. That's just what they do. They'll just <laughs> cut your throat open. And we're just like, if the bear wrestler is afraid of the yeah. wolves, then how should we feel standing next to the camera? Um, and it was really interesting because like we had such such long kind of um, takes where we had to like do a lot of choreography and we needed the animals to kind of act the way our actors do. We need to hit, have them hit marks. Um, there was a scene where we needed a wolf to, to come into close up when we were talking to an animal wrangler. It's like, how do we get this close up for this wolf? We need him to kind of be in frame and like well you just kind of throw a piece of meat next to the lens of the camera and see if it works <laughs> like, that doesn't sound like that sounds horrible like what about our poor cameraman he's yeah. like right next to this wolf yeah. it was all safe but it was all you know it was you're working with live animals it added to kind of not only did it add to the experimental and adventurous feeling of the film that we had as filmmakers but it just you know it made it a little bit scarier too yeah because <laughs> when that wolf jumps into the frame it's like Ooh, <laughs> nice doggy, nice doggy. And for a moment, I thought that snake was a digital creation, but it, what, that was yeah, real. it was. I mean, it's kind of a blend, um, but yeah, it was 100 percent real on set. In fact, that's the second snake because the first one flew down the creek, and he wanted to. Uh, he got free. He he wanted wanted to, so, yeah. Oh, <laughs> freedom! <Yeah. laughs> and. Um, just uh, there are a number of moments like you know one person says I'm not going in there and does go in there. Was that an actual cave at the? the yeah, point? it was. It's it's funny because for the longest time we thought we were going to have to build like a cave on set, which which just isn't as cool as finding a real one. But during one of our location scouts, we were scanning by like this rock wall and we saw this little opening opening in the in the wall and it was really dark and it was not map on any maps. And so, kind of again, in the adventurous spirit of the film, like we got a couple flashlights, ventured inside, and just went all the way back where like it started filling up with water. And it kind of it was like, terrifying. We have to shoot yeah. here. This is exactly what we wrote, and it was super scary. And yeah, it's just like we got lucky like that. And it's like a lot of different locations. Um, our mantra on the film is always like, if we can do it practically, if we can do it without building sets, or we can do it without visual effects, like we always took that opportunity. Um, another sequence in the film that's a great example of that is the train game where the kids are playing on the train tracks and this train kind of comes up as the girl runs out onto the tracks. And um, our VFX team was like, guys, we can do this 100% visual effects, like no problem. And we're just like, yeah, okay, like that's cool. And then our practical guys, our stunt team was like, let's do this for real. Like we can get a train, we can control um, six cars of an actual freight train. Um, and we just kept saying like, what would our heroes do? What would like somebody like Christopher Nolan do? What would, what would Alfred Hitchcock do? Like they would go with practical effects. So we, we got a, a real train for that sequence. And, and again, part of the adventurous spirit of making the film. Yeah, the train sequence, I mean, I was convinced for a moment that that was like not real. I mean, <laughs> train sequences can be very troubling when making a movie, but yeah. it sounds like you had full control over yeah, it. We control, yeah, we had a great stunt team and, and great control of it. So it was, it was a safe way to do it, but it was also very effective in terms of storytelling. Wonderful, wonderful. And um, I understand you have another movie coming up that's being produced by Darren Aronofsky, is that correct? Yeah, we yeah. can't talk much about it other than to say, like, we're, you know, the, the writer Mark Heyman who did Black Swan, we're just huge fans of his of his work and, and um, we're working on that project with him now and he's been a joy to work with. Yeah. And, and it's very much like um, the storyline is kind of fatal attraction for the 21st century, which we feel like there hasn't been like an heir to the throne that really taps into how we manage our daily lives on, on social media. So hopefully that'll be next. Yeah, that'll be interesting. It's been a formula that's been asleep for a while. So. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I mean, of all the places you looked at to shoot this movie in, what was it about Utah that really uh, brought you into that? Uh, you know, Utah is just, it's a beautiful state that has a huge range of many locations. It has everything from forests up in the mountains to those beautiful Monument Valley deserts that John Ford used to shoot at. I mean, I feel like you could almost shoot any movie in Utah and probably <laughs> figure it out. Um, and the other main thing that attracted us was that um, Don Shane, the line producer, he had, he's worked in the horror genre before. He did Frozen in Utah, and, and he just really loved Nightlight, and he kind of promised us, like, you guys take this movie to Utah, I will get you an A-plus crew, I will get you the best guys in the state. And um, we trusted him, and, and he came through, and, and that was the main reason, because we knew it was going to be um, a difficult movie to shoot, and we just wanted, you know, the support of the best people that we could find. Absolutely, absolutely. And then, um, not to give anything away, there are certain shots where 
uh, we see characters or cameras fall from a great height. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Um, was that done practically, or was yeah, it it's done yeah. yeah, because we actually um, on on set we did have stuntmen like uh, going down like hundred foot, two hundred foot cliff faces with with a full red camera to oh, kind wow. of achieve like what we hoped would at least be kind of a reference for what we wanted certain shots to be so our crew was just so awesome they were just always like let's do it for real like don't at, like anytime like we could do something for real our crew was like we want to do this um which is guys on the mountains yeah. like they wanted to do that they really like begged in you know you don't have to ask us twice we're like that's sweet that's awesome like we it taps into the fun like of, of making movies like when we were kids we were watching like saturday morning specials on the making of, of like terminator 2 or something and like oh, yeah. what always what we always loved about that was like for instance in that james cameron always wanted to do practical effects with with the machine and such and so we just wanted to have that same spirit of filmmaking great great and you said you had five weeks to shoot this film yeah right? five weeks in utah yeah. and what was the budget um, we can't say the budget, but I mean it's very much in, in range of like movies of, of like paranormal activity franchise. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah like Insidious, that kind of yeah. micro budget. Yeah. Course, mm -hmm. it's, it's interesting to see how how much you can stretch a movie creatively with very little money. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's it. Definitely looks like you guys did that with this film. Well, yeah. thank you. Oh, thank you very much. You bet. Uh, was there anything you really wanted to put into this movie that you were not able to for one reason or another? Yeah, I, I think um, when we look at the cutting room floor, a lot of the scenes that aren't there in the finished product versus what the script was were um, more nuanced character moments. Um, there was a lot of. Uh, uh, you know, character arcs and character exploration that we shot, but it's just like there's something about the point of view that it's like it's really terrific for the scare set pieces. Uh, but when you're conveying emotion and character, it gets a little bit trickier. So we kind of had to trim a lot of that out to keep the movie kind of moving forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing, too, I would say is that. Um, the original film was all runners. Like there wasn't kind of a jump cut style. It was it was like so. For example, the final um, twenty minutes of the movie we did as a is one long kind of Birdman esque take essentially. Um, even with all the VFX and everything. Um, and while that was like super artistically satisfying, we just kept feeling like there's something a little bit alienating about it. Perhaps something a little bit too self indulgent about it. Um, so ultimately, we kind of trimmed the movie back to what you see now. Great. And what were like the biggest challenges filming in the forest? Um, I think just the fact that very much in the spirit of the movie, like we were living in the darkness, and so you're out there with flashlights, and, it, and it's dangerous terrain as well. So there certainly were a few like minor injuries that happened on set, but um, more than anything, I think it was just about coming together as as a team and just kind of embracing, you know. The terrifying nature of being all alone with these crazy set pieces, whether it's a train or the wild wolves. I also think the forest might have been a little haunted. <laughs> there, was, there was one night, it's the, the night of uh, Robin's kind of big monologue where she talks about Ethan and, and her past in the dance. And, and every time she, we probably ran that scene 30, 40 times, like long takes, just kind of doing it over and over and over again. And every time she got to the park to talk about like where Ethan like came in and saw her at the dance without him. Um, there was this eerie howling in the background in the forest and the trees were like, this place is haunted, like this is real, this isn't even pretend anymore, <laughs> it's super creepy. Yeah, I mean, just you see that forest, I mean, remember after seeing Blair Witch Project, I'm like, I'm never going to a forest ever again. Because, <laughs> yeah, you get that feeling here, it's like, you know, these kids want to get out, but you kind of like can't find your way out, that's the scary thing about it. Yeah. Yet there's a certain beauty to forests that is inescapable, you know. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then also just as, you know, as teenagers, you kind of want to push the limit of things and see what you can, you know, get away with. It's like, you know, it's like scared, testing yourself to see how scared you would get in this kind of environment. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that's... teenagers are always doing things that they're told not to do and not supposed to do. And of course, they're going to go out to the woods and tell me. <laughs> And um, yeah, and there's something just, you know, the forest in the dark specifically is just innately terrifying. I think it's just a survival instinct that we all have from the time that we were cavemans. It's just a survival instinct. We're just afraid to be out in the forest alone in the dark because something bad could happen. Absolutely, yeah. And um, I did enjoy the moment, but it looks like uh, one of the characters is coming across a bloody backpack. She, she finds out that it She's like, ooh, gross, and then she finds out it's condoms. Yeah, yeah. that was a great moment. I was expecting yeah. her to take out a human head. Or right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
like that's great. Yeah, it's great to hear. We've always enjoyed. We, we love those horror movies that kind of like inject humor throughout. There's something fun about that, you know. Yeah, I think like uh, Hitchcock was a master of that. Like even in his, his later films, like Frenzy, like all the exposition would always come over this like hilarious like dinner table sequence right. that was just full of laughs and that would be peppered throughout the entire film. So for us, it always comes back to finding those moments where you can have some levity, um, even when you know things are getting really scary. I mean, Jaws. Jaws is one of the greatest comedies of all time. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's hilarious. Yeah. It, it also is. happens to be very terrifying. It, yes. It is. <laughs> It always helps to have really good characters in a horror movie, and yeah, the humor does come in handy at times, otherwise, you know, <laughs> yeah. it can be too ter terrifying, you know, a la Texas Chainsaw Massacre. <laughs> I should take away from that, that's a classic. It's a classic. <laughs> and um, uh, what's, what's, aside from the, the project we were talking about earlier, what, what would you like to do next? I mean, there's a couple films definitely in the horror genre that we're working on that, that, that don't really work in the found footage genre, um, but they're, they're certainly like on the canvas of like The Conjuring or The Sixth Sense where um, they're still horror pieces, but they also have this dramatic emotional through line. I mean, Rosemary's Baby is another touchdown for us. I mean, what a terrific movie. It's so scary, but it also is just a drama between this young couple who's cohabitating for the first time and they have an apartment and they have new neighbors. And yeah, we're always trying to find um, something that's kind of a scary high concept, but um, has relatable elements that we all experience as that's great, yeah, because that's that's what really makes horror movies work. Exactly. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much, guys. Cool. Thank you. You bet.